Welcome back to the Produce Safety Workgroup meeting for Thursday. I appreciate everybody coming back uh, for a second day. We've got another exciting um, topic to cover today. And I'm excited to kick off the presentation with uh, Lisa McKeague from University of Massachusetts and Robert Haddad from Cornell University. All right, so I, uh, before we jump into the main component of the day, I wanna set the stage and um, describe the history of this particular project and why we are uh, talking about this issue of risk assessment and um, risk-based approach thinking this morning. So for those of you who were at the NECAF's annual meeting in Philadelphia in January of 2020, we had a produce safety workgroup meeting um, in a very large ballroom and Chris and Betsy were facilitating the discussion. And one of the questions that was raised and the group was brainstorming is, shout out your research needs. What research do you think needs to be done in order to help inform the work that we all do? And there was a interesting uh, back and forth that was created where one person in the room would raise their hand and say, We'd, I'd love to have research on X, Y, or Z. And someone else in the room would respond and say, oh, actually, I did research on, on that, or my colleague did, and it was published, uh, I think, in 2018. And... Um, Again, the same thing would happen. And that went back and forth for, you know, several minutes. And it it, it was very uh, interesting to, to see that there was research questions were being asked or topic, general topic areas. And someone else in the room would say, oh, but actually, I think there, there was something done on that. And it was clear that there was a gap between published research and getting <laughs> that information out to the people who actually um, need to know what that research is or are making decisions on the farm, either through education or inspections. And so uh, at that same conversation, Don Schaffner said, well, I actually have a data set of a, a list of all the published research over a period of time that I had created for another project. And I would be happy to, to share that information. And so what happened was, um, Lisa, Robert, and formerly uh, Caitlin, who was part of Robert's team at Cornell, we submitted a food safety outreach program grant and titled Extending and Summarizing Existing Produce Safety Research. And that project was funded uh, a year ago. And so at last year's annual meeting, we needed to identify what were some of the primary research questions that our region had that we needed to do lit reviews on in order to translate research findings into educational material for those who are not doing lit reviews every day. And so last year we collected inspectional observation data of non-compliance and misunderstandings that was summarized and we held breakout groups. And during those breakout groups last year, all of you went through root cause analysis and one of the questions that you answered was, what are some of the research questions or what are some of the educational needs that you see as a result of these identified misunderstanding and noncompliance issues? And we sifted through all of those Google Doc notes that were taken and we identified and formed research questions that needed to be answered through literature review. And you can see in the bottom, these are the questions that we have formed. This is sort of the topic area because there's not room here for all the questions, but dropped covered produce was a question, wildlife contamination, pathogen survival on different materials, personal possessions, so cell phones, uh, those kinds of things, somebody, something people interact with, wash water, and then irrigation system, uh, particularly inspections of irrigation water systems. And we then uh, started to a lit review on the first question, which was dropped covered produce. And um, Johanna Doran, who was previously with NECAFs, started to this project and she completed the dropped covered produce uh, literature review, which was recently published 
And that is the journal article that I sent to everybody ahead of time to look at and is the basis for the conversation today. And so I will now turn it over to Lisa to continue with the presentation. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so as Elizabeth just said, the first question we decided to look at was around drought produce. Um, even though Christina noted yesterday that that would kind of drop down a, a notch on the priority list, but I think it's still um, still kind of a vexing issue to regulators and educators. Uh, came up a lot in the discussions last year at the NECAPS conference. Um, how risky is it? Really, what is it? Um, those are some of the questions that we kind of had on our mind as we were thinking about the research. Um, so as a reminder in the blue box on this slide here is the PSR definition of drop produce, produce that drops to the ground before harvest. Um, so it seems like somewhat straightforward uh, an issue where the FDA's guidance stating that they consider tomatoes still attached to the plant, touching the ground to be drop produce. I think that kind of added confusion for many of us about what should be considered dropped um, and therefore not harvestable. So our goal was to summarize the research around this question basically how risky is it to harvest produce that is or has been in contact with the ground. Um, and as far as the rule goes, we wondered what, what is the ground? Uh, so with the bigger goal being to help regulators and educators and growers all make better calls about how to be in compliance with the rule uh, and more importantly, to reduce contamination risks. So just on this slide, these are some pictures that I found in my photos that could potentially all be of drop produce, apples uh, in the top right corner that have fallen on the soil. Those are the first things that come to my mind when I think of drop covered produce. Um, but then there's also these trellised tomatoes in a greenhouse that might have either fallen onto or be touching this landscape fabric. Um, cucumbers that touch the ground, those they touch the ground in the normal course of their growing, but some growers stake them in the field, like they stake tomatoes. So does that change how the term dropped might get interpreted? Um, is touching mulch safer than touching bare soil? Does the research point to any sort of best practice that can help a regulator meaningfully focus on risk reduction when enforcing the rule. So that was kind of a, a guiding question, I think, when we were looking at what the research said. So if you want to change the slide, Elizabeth. Um, so we were fortunate to have a long list of research papers related to produce safety to start with to find research on this question, thanks to the one that Don Schaffner uh, and his team created as part of a different project. Um, and as Elizabeth mentioned, Johanna Doran was hired by NECAFS as the main researcher. So she sorted through all of these papers and in research databases to find anything related to ground contact of raw produce. So that included bare soil and also different mulch materials. Um, we maybe started out this project thinking it would be just a matter of summarizing the existing research to be able to highlight some general recommendations for growers to follow uh, to avoid harvesting or to reduce the risks from drop produce. But, um, wasn't that simple. Research conclusions aren't often definitive. Um, there's lots of variables to consider, the likelihood of fecal contamination in the area that you're talking about, um, from what animal, what season is it, the air temperature, the soil temperature, soil moisture, and like I said, the, the types of ground surface. So the results from all of these different things might um, even contradict each other sometimes, particularly if you change any of these variables, like where the study was done or which crop you're looking at. Um, and a lot of the trials that were done that we looked at were in a lab and would have to be repeated in applied settings to see if the results remain consistent. So some of the papers we looked at did make recommendations for growers, but then when we considered all the papers together, we didn't really feel like they were generalizable enough across all of the scenarios that were explored in each of the trials. So um, Elizabeth shared with you in an email, I think the, the review paper that came out of this work that we're gonna discuss later, um, it includes a summary table of each of the relevant papers that, that we looked at and kind of some of the salient factors in each of the trials that, that you can consider when, when considering that work and thinking about risk assessments. Um, and it also includes a long list of questions to guide future research, which might include applied research, which could be helpful for all of us and for, for researchers to think about going forward. Um, I did want to share the highlights from the paper just to illustrate that the answers aren't super clear cut. And I think maybe this will inform our discussion as we move forward in this, <laughs> in this day. Um, and if you want to just bring those up maybe one by one, Elizabeth, we found that the first thing that ground moisture, contact time, and crop features all influence the contamination risk from produce touching the ground. Um, but then maybe surprisingly, the next one, 
which is no, that their it's, soil it's, it's, a, it's not. Uh, I mean, their soil presents a lower risk of contamination, contaminating produce than than plastic mulch, at least in the studies that we looked at. Um, and then next, that mulches may actually promote pathogen persistence in soil compared to bare ground. Um, but we also found finally that mulches can protect produce if the soils are contaminated by limiting the contact between the soil and the produce. So um, those were some of the main highlights from the research that we looked at. And you can see that that doesn't create a, um, doesn't make for definitive recommendations and you can move to the next slide. Um, so we wondered how do you use this science to inform a risk-based decision-making process? Um, I think the more robust that body of evidence is to support a particular practice for managing risk, the more confident you can be. Um, but as the list of questions that we came up with just around this one question of drop produce suggests, there is still a lot of work to be done before we can answer a lot of very specific farm food safety questions with a lot of confidence. Um, so one question that we have now for, I think all of you, and for this, this process that we're gonna go into in a minute, um, is what's the best way to present this information from this paper um, and in the reviews that we're still working on for some of the other questions that we're looking at um, so that we can help, we can use it to help inform good risk management decisions and sort of more broadly, how do we use this whole process, this risk assessment, this process in our work when it comes to, you know, all the different situations that can arise when we're trying to help growers comply with FISMA and, and protect their customers and protect their, their products. So I think that's our work here today is to try to better understand this process. And I think Robert is going to introduce that now. Ah, good morning. Yeah, our our our, our next segment is, is really we're gonna like dig into this, and and you can see you you'll you'll understand our conundrum uh, going through this. I mean, one while we were working on this over the over the past uh, year or so, uh, I mean, it really struck home. I mean, uh, while this was going on, I'm I'm doing my regular farm visits uh, and also doing on farm readiness reviews, and had one very poignant moment uh, visiting an Amish farm uh, who had uh, strawberries uh, growing um, and they're all, you know, you know, as strawberries do kind of grow touching the ground. Uh, they had straw between the rows and we're talking to the family. Uh, it's a husband, wife, and I think it was like six children uh, about picking strawberries. And, you know, they, they were using, uh, we, we just happened to be at the point about talking about um, you know, dropped produce. Um, it was an on-farm readiness review for them. Uh, and, and so they were just kind of like all crowded around staring, going, so what's the issue with dropped produce? Um, and, and we're trying to explain it. Uh, and, and I just lo looking at their faces and I think it was like their seven-year-old son says, we can't eat strawberries that roll off the box onto the straw. <laughs> Uh, and and it was like like how do I answer him, um, you know because they want to know why. Uh, so it, it's it's a it's a it, it was really a, a tough moment. And so coming back to the group uh, as we're you know trying to review all of this, uh, and I, I, we we went back and forth quite a bit. Uh, so we're we're hoping today that our, our distinguished guests, Don Schaffner and Ben Chapman, uh, will help us. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, talk about this and 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 get across uh, the, this. Uh, you know, how to analyze uh, this risk mitigation. Um, so everything seems, you know, hopefully will work out smoothly. But I tend to 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 doubt that we'll uh, we'll all agree. So um, so yeah, the lit the literature as it stands, um, it, it it it's not it's not helping a whole lot. However, I'm hoping that, that maybe through these efforts that when re new researchers are looking for projects, they'll take this kind of thing into consideration uh, and, and, and plan their experimental designs a little bit differently, uh, looking at variables, not from a necessarily, you know, a sterile lab point of view, but from a practical uh, point of view, uh, uh, you know, that these regulations uh, are, uh, are, are forcing us to, uh, you know, to, to deal with these situations. So uh, enough of us, uh, let's introduce, uh, let, let's go with Don and Ben, uh, the C Siskel and Ebert of the, uh, the food safety arena. Uh, 
let's move ahead. So I don't even I, know I, where to go. I want to know which, the, which one is Siskel and which one is Ebert. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, I'm trying so, to think of the most appropriate joke, but there's nothing. Oh, pro- <laughs> they're, they're, they're both dead, so I yeah. think we should probably not make any jokes. Um, so so speaking of speaking of humorous things, Ben, um, and again, we have we have a hat. So we should explain for people like we do this. We do this professionally as part of our as part of uh, pro- professionally as part of our podcast. Um, but but we don't usually go on for half an hour. So we're going to have to like vamp a little bit, I think, to make this whole, whole thing last half an hour. So as part of that vamping, Ben, um, what are you wearing? <laughs> well, you can see today I'm wearing like a just a normal but you're, what we usually do but what, so what you're saying is i'm the only one that's wearing podcast merch today i think yeah. so oh man. yeah I, i'm wearing a some sort of a um a record company record label uh shirt um which and, is yeah sorry you, i wasn't and, prepared and you today you also said earlier via text message that you'd be wearing sweatpants true but i'm wearing shorts because it's a little ah. warm in my office so yeah um no so, before we yeah. i mean i think before we get get too far into this for the for those of you who don't know Don and I and don't know kind of what we do um, on our on our two podcasts, th- this question is like this series of questions is really um, academically interesting, and it's something that I think we wrestle with as communicators outside of the world of making decisions within extension or regulatory realm. You know, what we, we run two, two podcasts, one called food safety talk, which we've done for gosh, I think it's like nine years or something now, but about two years ago, um, a few people that listened to that podcast asked us to not just like pontificate on some of these questions for like an hour, like, just give us an answer. Like, should I do something with, you know, like if I've had leafy greens left in my refrigerator for two weeks, are like, can I eat them? Like, are they risky or not? And, and, and the, the thing that I think that Don and I, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to walk you through here over the next 30 minutes is our approach on how we do that. That held us to something that we weren't asked to do in the past right like we we both come at the the area of foodborne illness risks from different approaches don has a a background in microbial modeling and mathematics i have a background in communication um and we both are really interested in what people do and how that impacts risk but but often we're allowed to not allowed i mean we we made the podcast we weren't pressured by others to just give a definitive answer because ultimately what Robert highlighted there is you know the the, the situation around drop produce or whatever whatever the 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 practice is or whatever the whatever the situation is on a farm ultimately has to lie like has to be answered with is this risky or not like should I ship this should I pack it should I do something with it that isn't just throw it out? And what's the risk to me as a business? And I think that the regulations answer some of this, but as as was highlighted by um, Lisa and Elizabeth and, and Robert, it's not always, there's a gray area. And so, nice, well done, Don. That's, um, that's, the, well, uh, that's what we're not allowed to do on this yeah. short podcast. <laughs> right, right. So, so over the last like two years, we've kind of forced ourselves to try to make a 15 minute decision on something that sometimes it's incongruent with the regulations and sometimes it's congruent with the regulation. And, and this is, you know, I, I think the, the way to sort of set our expectations on what we're going to run through over the next 30 minutes is, is exactly that. What we're trying to do is, is figure out what's practical and what we would be comfortable doing. And it, it, you know, the, so, so, so for us, we, we've not been able to go back and forth. 
so much. We've we've had to hit we we come we become the risk managers. What's our threshold for risk? And I think that's a good place for us to to start because when I when I heard Elizabeth sort of introduce the um the, what we're going to do today, and I heard Lisa sort of talk about what the goal of that fantastic paper is. It was well, how risky is this? And and that's a really in, in some some spaces a personal decision, right? Like if, if how risky is it to my business? How risky is it to my customers? How risky is it uh, as I match it up with what the regulation is? What are the risks associated with it is really part of what we try to do in these 50 minute segments or today, 30 minutes to try to figure out what that what that threshold is. And I'll throw something you know out there that we don't talk about on every every podcast, but I think Don and I got to this point over six or seven years of a podcast, which is risk includes, well, how likely is something bad going to happen, right? What's the probability? And then what is the something bad? And if we're looking at it purely as a foodborne illness, that is a different calculation than how likely is it that a regulator is going to look at this in a different way, and I'm still going to have to recall my my produce, or I'm you know, whatever those um, whatever those, whatever those steps are. We really have to look at what what's the probability that anything bad is going to happen if I use dropped produce. So so for us, a lot of a lot of what we do is try to like land the plane on that. Like we want to define what our threshold is. And then we try to look for evidence out there that um, that helps us make that that decision. So yeah. So anyway, Don, that's and like what, what do you what do you have to add to that? Well, and again, just to take it back to Cisco and Ebert, right? Like one of the one of the I think the clever conceits of the show is that we each get a vote, right? And so what you'll see is if you listen to the show, and hopefully we'll do it here for you today as well, is there's going to be some back and forth. Um, and then we're each going to come up with a, a final decision, right? And I mean, it's even, again, it's even right here on the t-shirt, right? Like thumbs up or thumbs down, um, what Siskel and Ebert like, um, as to whether we think something is risky or not. And and we can, we're allowed to disagree. And and, and again, you can go on the website if, you, if you're into the, the math and the statistics of it, and you can see the extent to which we agree with each other and disagree um, and to the extent to which we think a thing is risky or not. And so, uh, and, and I think that that freedom to disagree with each other, but to try to understand the other guy's point of view is, is part of what we're going to do for you here today and part of what makes what makes this interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the, only, the only thing that I'll, I'll add on this, and, and I think this is important for the entire process of, not not just what we try to do on risky or not, but it's you know I think this was framed so beautifully by the three previous speakers. The 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 literature that's out there often doesn't answer things exactly how a question's asked that that we have that's really that's really practical practical right. Like as we go through some of the scenarios today, the one that that we're going to do and walk you through, but also the ones that that'll be in the breakout session. These are constructed because there isn't a paper that answers it specifically because we all as scientists approach these questions from different biases and different frames and because the how it was introduced to us is not all all the same that we have like for for us don and i force ourselves to make a decision when we record the show right like like we have this conversation here's the question but we also reserve the right because again, it's our it's our show and how we are as scientists. That if someone comes back to us, listens to the show, and is like, you know what, you missed an entire pocket of the literature. I would look at this differently. We're very open to having that conversation, revisiting it. Um, and and I and I think that 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 process is something that earlier in my career I wasn't very comfortable with. Like, like I'm much more comfortable with being wrong and having a discussion now, or maybe not being wrong, but missing something and having having someone else present something to me afterwards, after I've put myself out there and being like, you know what, actually, 
Yeah, I really agree now with this additional information that's that's being presented. And I think that this entire question about the risk associated with with drop produce it's evolving and you i mean this group has highlighted this explicitly here are a bunch of data gaps that we don't have we did a really nice literature review that says here's what we know but we still don't have all of these answers so i i look at that as like reserving everyone's right to come back and revisit this as those data gaps get filled to to re-up the the view of what's the what are the risks? You know, we know what the theoretical ones are. We can start now with what we, information we do have in hand, but we should always be striving to fill those data gaps and maybe coming back to this. And I think that that not for um, you know, I'll, I'll hope maybe maybe that may, maybe this make the regulators on the on the call uncomfortable or more comfortable. That's something that is really difficult to do in a regulatory world, right? Like is we we kind of have to set a threshold and we often stick to it. Going back and forth with m new information that just historically it's something that um, I think that there's a heartburn on, right? Like we're kind of forced to answer a question now and and just be like, all right, that's the answer that we're all gonna just stick to. So, Elizabeth, do you want to, we, yes, we didn't really quite um, nail down this, but do you want to sort of throw our um, situation or, or what, what you want us to talk through into the, into the chat, and then we'll kind of attack it how we would normally attack it? And again, this is what we try to do in our, in our, in our podcast is not um we don't we don't often over prepare for this like we we might come with we've read a couple of papers but we really want to get into the the debate um and let each other kind of steer the the conversation mainly because i think this is what's happening in a real time situation like we've thought about this if this arrives on a farm where we've got a situation like the what what robert kind of described we've got a situation with we've got some strawberries that have fallen into straw and we've got a child who's like, should I eat these? <laughs> you know, is it risky or not? Um, we're, we can't always predict where exactly what the question is, is going to be. Okay, your question is coming now. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And this is, I mean, this is literally the way that we do the show. Um, basically, we have a spreadsheet with potential questions, and then um, Ben picks one, and I, I don't look at what he's picking, and then. Um, it uh, and then I, I have to I have to answer it. So Ben, let's let's do this the way we would normally do this, um, and, and I'll just riff for a while and give you my thoughts, and then and then we can and then you can respond. How does that sound? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, right. And so what uh, what I will do, just so we uh, we we stay fully on brand, is I will read the intro because this is usually what like exactly how it works. So. Welcome to Risky or Not, a short podcast about everyday risk from germs. I'm Professor Ben Chapman from North Carolina State University, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Don Schaffner from Rutgers University. We promise to, in, our, in this podcast, we promise to do our best not to waffle, dither, dissemble, or equivocate, and to give you today's audience straight up answers about whether something is risky or not. Don, today's topic comes to us from a listener to the show, Elizabeth. Elizabeth writes in the chat, melons are grown on plastic mulch, but the vines grow out in the middle of a row. So some melons are growing on plastic and others are growing on bare ground. So the canonical question for today, Don, is melons growing on bare ground or um, plastic risky or not and there's really two questions there but that's what i sometimes throw at dawn yeah and so, so what, what are your thoughts well so you know ben uh when we when we do this um uh as we usually do this on the internet we are not looking at each other and we are not sharing the screen um but i actually uh i actually asked elizabeth of all the wonderful questions that she, that she put together for everybody to look at um i actually asked her for this particular question because it turns out ben um we've actually done some research on this and so uh there's a paper 
um, entitled Quantification of Salmonella Enterica Transfer Between Tomatoes, Soil, and Plastic Mulch. Now, you're saying to yourself, well, you said melons, and this paper's about tomatoes. Um, so yes, technically, we didn't study melons. Um, and this is a paper uh, that was the lead author was my graduate student, uh, Jenny Todd Searle, who now works for Mondelez, and then a whole cast of characters from a variety of locations around the country and now around the world. And so without getting to, and I certainly don't want to read to you from the paper, um, but but what, one, what we did was we looked at transfer between tomatoes, soil, and plastic mulch, um, in different, looking at different types of mulch, both, both new and used mulch, and also different soil types that common to the three areas where we did the research. So uh, that would be Ohio, Florida, or actually, no, sorry, it would be, it would be Ohio, Maryland, and Florida. And, and we, and then we didn't, we, we do grow tomatoes in New Jersey, but we didn't study New Jersey soil type, um, we, cause we were the, the people doing the, the analysis. And Ben, this may blow your mind a little bit, um, but if you, depending on how you do these experiments, you actually get more transfer from the plastic mulch than you do from the soil. And, and part of that has to do with the way that we do these experiments, right? And so we're looking at putting marker microorganisms deliberately onto the surfaces and then looking at transfer. And lo and behold, if you put a, a slurry of microorganisms onto plastic mulch, most of those organisms stay right there on the plastic mulch. They don't soak down into the soil. Whereas if you inoculate the soil, the organisms soak down into the soil. And what that means is that they're not all there available at the surface of the soil to, to transfer to whatever you put on it. And so uh, my, my answer Answer my my considered answer, and we can we can dither and equivocate a little bit before going before coming up with a final answer. My answer, and again, this is just me speaking as a microbiologist. I don't work for a regulatory agency. I, this is not this is not uh, a discussion about regulatory policy. Okay, for that you should talk to a regulator. But honestly, Ben everything else being equal, you're going to have less transfer from the soil than you are from the mulch. Now, where it gets interesting is what if there is somehow something that has already contaminated the soil, and then you put the mulch on top? Well, okay, yes, of course, if you have the contamination under the mulch, then it's not going to transfer. But I guess the question is how often, how prevalent, again, getting back to your earlier point about, uh, about um, uh, frequency and severity, how common is it to have foodborne pathogens um, sitting in the soil in the area where you're, uh, where you're growing your, your melons? And, and, and again, there's other risk mitigations that hopefully uh, a grower has put in place to make sure that that soil around those melons is not, is not, uh, doesn't have pathogens, right? And again, we, we can talk about uh, biological soil amendments of animal origin, we can talk about flooding, we can talk about uh, ag, ag water uh, and, the, and quality of ag water, and all of those come to bear on this issue. But again, like I said, all things being e equal, if a bird flies over and the bird, bird poops on the soil or the bird poops on the plastic mulch, I'm much less worried about the bird poop that's on the, the, the soil because it's, it's going to be it's going to be basically eventually subsumed by the soil. So I've been talking for a while. What do you think? Yeah, so and and I want to want to highlight just again how great the review paper um, that was presented earlier is because I think it really does a good job talking through the types of factors that are important to, to think about out out in a in a growing environment, right? So so you highlighted um, a few things that that um, that are in there. I think the how wet the environment is really matters. One thing that I will add in here, and it, it's in the, um, it's, you haven't talked about Don, but it, it's certainly in that paper. Um, it's really about what's happening post-harvest with these cantaloupes as well. Are we looking at a, you know, a, a Western U.S. kind of environment where it might be a dry melon, where there's not washing, where contamination coming from the field now can be exacerbated if not if not managed well in the um in that washing uh process but but having and, and again i think this is one of the challenges we have in 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 field production having a sense of timing between rain events and pooled water um and what was happening with with growth before harvest is also part of the answer here. But I think that the way that Elizabeth 
ask the question. It's really like, okay, we and, and I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna take a little editorial license here. You know, we would expect that if it's grown on um, on plastic, that it's not risky because that's the way that we would grow melons and sell it. Like we've made an assumption that it's that it's okay. The the question really is, is it any riskier if any of those melons are are then now touching the soil? And and I think what what you presented and and what's what's certainly in the um in the literature that was summarized in the um in in the in the review paper is that it's not it's it's not any more risky and and it might be less risky because it's it's bare soil based on on the data. So I'm going to be the first one to to come out and sort of say it's if our if we make the assumption that on the plastic is not risky, then I would say on the bare soil is also not risky. So I'm going not risky for this. And again, like Don said, this isn't a regulatory answer, right? Like this is our what's the likelihood? And maybe this is a good good place for me to go back. What's what are we talking about here in the in the risk? Is there a chance that there's a foodborne pathogen that moves from that soil into or onto this melon? Is it any greater risk than if it was on that um, on that bare plastic? And I, I think that the literature points to no. How we handle it from a regulatory standpoint is is a little bit different. Back back to you, Don. Yeah, and I think I think that's that's really the point. And it, often the entry point. And so, so what? So one of the so I, one of the other things that that I do when I'm not doing stuff like this or podcast with Ben is I work with people in the food industry to help them manage risk in a regulatory context. And one of the things that's very helpful when you're doing that is to say, well, this activity X, we don't know whether it's quote unquote risky or not. We don't know whether it's in compliance with the regulations or not. But we have this other situation Y where we know by definition that is allowed by the regulations. And so let's try to now use math and statistics to figure out whether X is equivalent in risk to, to Y. And again, very often these, for me, these come down to scenarios where you have um, uh, potentially hazardous foods or TCS foods that are out of temperature control for a certain amount of time, or you have a cooking deviation for a product or a cooling deviation. And we know in, the, in those contexts, the regulations prescribe certain situations as quote unquote safe or, or, or in compliance or meeting guidelines. And so can we reason to another situation? Can we reason from the situation that we're trying to decide about to the reason that we, we have a definitive answer to? And again, I think you put your finger right on it, Ben. We assume that growing produce on plastic mulch is quote unquote safe, or it is quote unquote in compliance with guidance or regulations. The question is is not is it risky or not to be on the soil. It's it's how risky is it in comparison to the mulch. And and again, I think for the reasons that are laid out in the work that we've done and that are summarized in the lit review that Elizabeth so nicely linked there in the chat. Um, you know, it's not. Um, I don't think it's any riskier. And so yeah, I, I'm I, again the question as phrased and as discussed. I would give the same answer. I would say not risky. There's a there's another question from Robert in the chat that I want to address here in a, in a second, but I'm going to add something that that I think you know we I don't know if we if we skipped over it or made some assumptions about it, but but I you know I think back we um, Don and I have a, a close colleague Linda Harris at UC Davis who's done a lot of work in almond orchards and um, the soil as a source for salmonella pathogens in almond orchards has been really well detailed in the literature. And it's geography based. It's not that there's some animal source, it's finding the exact same PFG match that just persists in the soil year after year after year, a decade later, that, that, there's, that the soil is a source in those specific situations. And I don't think we have the same level of detail known about melon growing fields. I know there's certainly been some soil work done um, in uh, in Florida, uh, as well as in, um, in New York State, looking at Listeria and Salmonella, respectively. And I think we're building the literature on that. But I think that this is one where if we answered this question today based on data that we have and not getting into the nuance from Elizabeth's questions on is this in a so in a field where we know that there are salmonella um, that that's established itself as, as a source in the soil? 
but but it's a more general question. But as this evolves, we happen to know that in certain geographic regions where melons are grown, that there would be higher incidence of um, the just the likelihood of uh, of uh, of salmonella becoming persistent within that soil year after year and not being transient. Um, then then I think it's a different. I think it's a different answer, um, but I would sort of throw back. Well, what is the likelihood that that soil is moving on top of that mulch through dust, through water, or or whatever? And we are we still looking at maybe that geographic location is carrying equal risk between the what's on the plastic and what's on the bare soil compared to another geographic location? I think it's to be determined, but I think that that's part of like something that we would throw into our discussion here. Um, you know, all things equal, the way that Elizabeth asked the question, I, I, I'm still saying that there's no, you know, there, there's no risk difference. So I'm going to go with with not risky, but I think that it's maybe different from location to location. And I'll drop a couple of links to, to those studies. And again, this is what we try to do on the podcast is anytime we, we think about something historic that, like Don, so I, I think articulately said, we may not be answering, we, we may be looking at these other studies that help us inform the, the specific question um, that we want to make sure that that's part of our answer. Yeah, and I'll, I'll deal with Robert's question. Are the melons smooth skinned or netted? I think this is a really good question. And of course, these are hypothetical melons, so they can be whatever we want them to be. But but I think the the real issue is like think, I mean, I think what and Robert is getting at in his question is how does how does the 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 topography of the surface of the melon influence this? And again, I'll say from some other work that we've done on, on cross-contamination, there's, there's really two aspects to this. I think a smooth melon is going to make better contact with the surface. And so you're going to have more transfer to the smooth melon versus the netted melon, because the netted melon is not uh, evenly contacting the contaminated surface. But, and here's where it gets interesting, once that netted melon is contaminated, it now may be harder to remove the contamination from that netted melon. So more transfer to smooth melons but also more easy to remove from smooth melons. Um, and so that's, again, and, and, and again, you know, these are hypothetical melons, and so we, we, can, we can make them whatever we want. Um, but but it, that definitely comes into play. But the, in that particular case with those melons, and this is me just, just riffing here, not looking at the literature at the moment, um, but, but I suspect if we did, that's what we would find. So, um, and then, uh, Ben, we've got another question in the, in the chat. Do you want me to, 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 from Wendy, do you want me to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Wendy writes, um, do you use, and we got, we got to wrap this up here in about four minutes. So um, do you use customer perception, i.e. companies that conduct their own audits on farms as part of the equation in the risk assessment? Um, so that's interesting. <clears throat> perception is not part of risk assessment, but it can be part of risk management. And so one of the things that we, we didn't do is just lay out the context here uh, between risk assessment and, and risk management. But basically, risk analysis is the everything. Risk assessment is the scientific calculation and the data. Risk management is what you do. And what you decide to do about a risk may, incl may include how people perceive that risk or how that, that, that your action or inaction or, or a particular action could be perceived. Yeah, and, and the only thing that I would I, I'll add to um, to Wendy's question um, <clears throat> here is that I, I think that those audits have utility, but they're not about trying to assess the risk of a specific situation, or not designed to do that. Right? Like they, those audits are developed the audits and the audit schemes are developed based on a set of general principles that, that I think are well established in the literature about things that are important. But when we get to a very specific question like this, the compliance with an audit doesn't really help. Um, it doesn't add a lot of detail to answering this, this question because that audit wasn't built to figure out how much soil may or may not move from bare soil to on top of the the plastic or to you know to Don's 
you know, to, to Robert's question and Don's answer about netted versus uh, non-netted um, uh, melons, we don't really, in, in the audit schemes that I've, doesn't really get into that specific detail. So, so the, so I, I don't think that, that it plays into our, our question specifically. Now, I could see where it could be, um, you know, if, if the question was rephrased to, um, you know, something around a company who has, who published information about their audits uh, and, and has shown really good standing, is it risky or not to, to produce or to sell um, melons that were grown on, on bare soil? I think it's a different, it's a different question because the risk is no longer just about the, the microbial contamination potential. It's now about, now about the risk of perception to the, to the company. Hopefully that wasn't too rambly, but yeah, Don. Yeah, and just one one more really good comment from uh, Michelle Smith in the chat. Con smell, bah, Michelle Smith in the chat. That's hard to say. Um, concerns about drops in the industry-led tomato metrics seem to be more to do with damage caused by the act of dropping than with contact, and so that's not relevant to the current issue where we're talking about melons that have just happened to be grown on the soil. But I think Michelle makes an excellent point, And that is that, yes, if you damage the fruit, right, that's a, bru a, a bruise site. And I know for sure there's research that's been done. I don't know about with salmonella and tomatoes, but certainly E. coli and apples. If you bruise an apple and then you put E. coli, pathogenic E. coli or generic E. coli on that bruise, that bruise site will grow pathogens to a greater extent or, or will grow pathogens versus the intact fruit uh, unbruised and undamaged, which won't. Um, and so that is a, it's an excellent, uh, an excellent point. Um, so, so yeah, the, the damage to the fruit plays into the calculation here as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I guess um, when, when we started talking about this, that this is where I thought about those, that post-harvest handling storage, um, uh, temperature, potential for growth, what's going to happen to that melon afterwards, if it's going to be cut versus sold as a raw agricultural commodity, all of those things, the more details we have on the specific question, the more you can characterize the risk um, and bring in those those factors. So yeah, it's, you know, I, I think that that's, in, you know, in a nutshell, that's what kind of, what Don and I try to do in a short amount of time is, is sort our ways through this, try to understand a little bit about what the assumptions are, and then try to display what our assumptions are as we answer the question, because it may not be exactly what the scenario is that someone who's answering the question or asking the question. Well, ben, ben, I think that's a show. Hey, we're yeah. out of time, anyway. Yeah, we're out of time. Yeah, Elizabeth, where do you wanna, how do yeah. we wanna handle this next? Where do we well, go? Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. I laughed a lot, which is always a better feeling than not laughing. So I appreciate your your presentation. I think that was that was very helpful and and entertaining and informative. Um, I'll set up the the breakout groups. And so where we go from here is that I shared a link in the chat to both the literature review, but also a summary table that summarizes those studies that are outlined in the in the lit review. So. If you're looking at the table, that's a better short, you know, hand sort of snapshot of what the research says. And you will all now go into breakout groups and you'll have the same type of discussion around your own scenario. And the we recognize that the, the question or the, the research was done around dropped produce specifically, and there is some regulatory, there are regulatory questions around that. And I've mentioned it in previous email, but I just wanted to reemphasize that the discussion shouldn't focus on whether or not regula through the regulation that it's dropped produce or not dropped produce, but rather the goal of this exercise is to look at the table, talk about the science, and really practice taking this more of a risk-based approach thinking to a p potential situation. Because in um, down the road, this, this work that Lisa and Robert and I are doing are going to continue to do lit reviews on research questions that this group has identified in the past. And as part of that, we will be putting out educational material and we need to best understand how information should be conveyed to you so that you can use it 
in the work that you do. And in reality, there are not going to be practice recommendations that come out of those lit reviews. It's just not possible. And so instead, we want to use this risk-based approach thinking. So conveying the science in a summary table giving you this frame of mind approach so that you can then use the output delivered through our project to apply it to on-farm decision-making. And so in this first instance, it just happens to be drop covered produce. And we will now go into those breakout sessions where you'll practice this. Now, the good thing is that we will be coming back after to report out and I think what I'll do is I'll maybe shorten our breakout group session discussion a little bit, because I think that there'll probably be some questions or some discussion that the group would like to have with Ben and Don as they've stumbled through this process, that they've, they've challenged, you know, they've challenged themselves, they have questions. And I think that that would be very valuable instead of just having a report out, rather actually have a bit more Q&A with Don and Ben around some of the challenges you had or some of the questions that came up in your discussions. So... Uh, from here, the, um, I'll turn it to Amy to go ahead and distribute the breakout groups. And um, again, we'll be sitting in this waiting room. If you have questions, please come back and we can help you. But thank you again and have a great Elizabeth. breakout group. Oh, so when are we going to return? If we're we'll put a timer. Forward? I think okay. probably 12.05, let's aim for. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to take the time to report out on what the group talked about. So I will, what we'll do is we'll go to each scenario. Uh, some of the scenarios, three of the groups had the same scenario and some of them, two of the groups had the same one. So we'll just start with one scenario and go through each of the groups that had that scenario. So the first one is leafy greens are harvested in bunches and then set on the ground next to the road to be picked up later. But then a vehicle drives by and splashes <laughs> water from a drainage ditch onto the greens. So the question for the groups going in was, what would you do based on, and justify your answer based on science? So whichever of the two groups wants to go first, let us know your answer. Great. I guess we'll, we'll go first. Um, Thanks to my team. Um, they're really helpful. And we, it was really great working with them right now. Uh, we have the answer about the leafy greens. And what we came up with was that um, possibly just uh, ask the farmer to um, throw it away. Um, but we also came up with some ideas. And uh, our notes uh, pretty much indicate that leafy greens and untreated surfaces water, um, we have to see that uh, no idea what it's in the drainage water. It uh, possibly, if uh, the leafy greens has, um, I'm sorry, the water, or the puddle has, there's a risk that might have manure or um, pesticide or residue that might uh, contaminate um, the leafy greens. Uh, the next one will be, it is possibly that if it's just one puddle that might uh, um, contaminate maybe half a row or maybe just a few bunches, it will be a major um, um, loss for the farmer. Great. Oh, go ahead, sorry, didn't okay. mean to cut you off. Um, the other um, team member mentioned about um, the opportunity to train workers about what to do if there is um, a splash in the water to train the workers or the farm manager or the, the foreman about letting them know there's a, if there's a splash to make sure that that product is not being uh, harvested and explain the reasons why to it. Okay, uh, who is the second group with this same scenario? We are. So we had a similar response in that we didn't spend too much time applying the science from the table, but quickly recognized that the water situation being surface water uh, and not knowing what's on the vehicle that splashed through it is a high risk. And we would encourage the farmer not to, well, we, we were also wondering what kind of greens, um, how much later are they being picked up? Where are they going? But we made the assumption that they were greens for the fresh market and decided it was in the spirit of the podcast risky. And we would not, um, want those greens going into commerce, but at least the ones that were splashed and, and 
we weren't, you know, sure if the whole row was splashed. So the others could be fine. We didn't inherently think that the contact with the soil um, was too risky, just as is with the information we had. Um, and then we went a little bit into some root cause analysis of what else could be changed to prevent the splash um, happening in the future. And yeah, we gave you some feedback on the on what we thought about the lit review table, um, even though it wasn't didn't feel as directly applicable. Um, but that's in our notes. Great, thanks, uh, Ben and Don. Anything to add or questions for those two groups? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I, I was playing out the scenario in my head as I listened to everybody talk, and I think they did a really nice job, right? I, I like the fact that they both thought about, well, okay, what is the qual quality of this water from the drainage ditch? And I think both groups thought that the quality was not very good, which I think is a reasonable assumption. <laughs> um, I like the fact that both groups talked about, well, we really don't have to ditch the entire bunch, right? We just have to look at where the splash occurred and then let's remove that portion. And then the product that was just sitting there, um, you know, and not splashed on. And again, we could argue about what's the zone, the splash zone, et cetera, all of that. Um, I'm interested, I'm interested that none of the groups, and maybe you did talk about it, none of the groups talked about what a possible remediation is. Maybe you you segregate the splash product and then you you hand wash it or you you know you treat it with a higher levels of sanitizer or something like that. I mean that's the other thing that that uh, that occurred to me. But no, I mean I think the, the groups really did a, a nice job of of working through it pretty much the way that that I would. How about you, Ben? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think the second group sort of highlighting where where I was um going as really the the contamination right here is is the water, and the first group mentioned this as well, but not that they were set on the on the ground, um, and that the um, just a, a well thought out approach to to handling what to what to do with it. Um, I think about um, you know information that I would that I would ask about, and I don't know if if again any of this would be in. Um, in hand, but all right, do we know anything about this drainage ditch? Is it is it ever used as agricultural water, which it likely is not, but do we know anything about the the quality of it, uh, of the water that you would expect to see in that in that drainage ditch? Um, and the, the but but I, I, I agree with, with Dawn, I think about like Segregating and remediation, I don't know if any of it's possible. I'd also go not risky on this one just based on the information that was that was presented. But yeah, I, th I thought that both groups did a good job reasoning through it. it. Can This is Betsy. Can I jump in here? We actually did talk about, well, remediation, bumpkiss ain't being remediated. I'm going to say that. No amount of bleach water washing is going to make me happy on this one. Um, but we did actually talk about the splash and the issue of um, again, the scenario we were given, right? It's all in your head of what you think happened. But um, I don't even care what the quality of the water is, even if you knew, because at the point where it's pooled and now mixed with soil and now splashed by a truck, I don't knew whatever quality you thought you had from a water test, that's now out the window to me. So the, the combination of silt and water splashed up onto that product made it made me say risky, Ben. To, to disagree yeah. with the not risky um, and, and with Don's, it's not mitigatable. Now it may be yeah. very isolated and you can assess where that isolation is and move beyond that, in my opinion. But we did actually discuss that in our group, but you don't, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I think Robson has a That's really great. good point in the chat. Um, if it happened to be spinach and you knew you could sell it for less money to somebody who would cook it, uh, you know, I think that's a reasonable uh, alternative as well, assuming that you could get rid of any silt or physical no. uh, debris. So, yeah. Hey. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Sorry. I might. Hopefully, I said it correctly. I'm. I, I'm very much risky on this. Oh, I thought I you thought, said not. I thought you said not risky. He said, he said not risky. Play back the tape. Yeah, I yeah, think I, he said not risky. No, I'm saying risky. I yeah, sorry. That was, <laughs> but I'm glad that generated more uh, we, like a, an emotional guttural response from Betsy Ben. With my role, yeah. you know me. I'm coming out with the bat swinging, Ben. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. We, we we do this on the podcast too. We have to say like, what did you say for that one? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, risky. I'm risky, risky. 
I'm not not risky. Did that help? Is that worse? <laughs> that made it worse. It did. Okay. I just had that discussion with my son when he was using those double negatives. I'm like, stop. Yeah. Think about what you said yeah. and rearrange that sentence so it doesn't sound like that. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Let's go to the next scenario. So cabbage is hand harvested with a knife and laid on the ground. Another person come behind to trim it and put it in the box. Boxes are stored upright and outside. So occasionally if there's been rain, they contain water. We have three groups on this question. Who would like to go first? I'm happy to go first, um, if that's okay. Thanks, Liz. Wendy. Yeah. Yeah, happy to. So I misled our group to, to think that we are the only ones with that. So sorry, group. Um, it looks like other folks will be weighing in too. So I'll just go ahead and talk about our process um, to get to at least one response. Um, and there will be some dithering um, along the way. Um, so we looked at, given the, the scenario that we first looked at the um, that there are multiple activities or conditions that might warrant sort of kind of a risk evaluation. And so just, I'm gonna just kind of, in the scenario, just kind of lay out what they were. We identified, so resting the cabbage on the ground run during the harvest, storing the boxes in the rain outside, and a particular note upright, not even uh, upside down. From this scenario, we don't know if these are, and we had this discussion, I'm sure other groups did as well, whether it's cardboard, whether these were the boxes going to the, your, your customers or whether these were some more just harvest containers going to a distributor yet to be shipped, put, added to, uh, put in boxes. Knife use, obviously that was a factor that you know added in, uh, of interest, just the, the tool that you're using for harvesting. Does the farm grower have an SOP? Um, how, is the, how is that knife cleaned and stored? How does the farm handle animal intrusion? Um, how do, does the farm handle BSAOs? So again, both of those looking at presence of fecal matter. And then how do they trim? What does that look like? Um, and it may or may not change the risk associated with the soil, um, depending on how the trimming occurs. Um, and then some, we also just, just a broader factor, just that was noted. Um, what Were there any outbreaks related? Are there any, have there, there been any outbreaks particularly related to cabbage? I think that was also just um, uh, added in, into that initial discussion. So then from there, we moved on to looking specifically to the risk um, associated and trying to look, you, you know, use the table, um, even though obviously cabbage was not included in any of the studies, so we missed it. Um, but thinking that it's not, we tried to look at just the risk associated with the trimming, I mean, sorry, with the laying the cabbage on the ground. And from the science, we looked at the presence of the fecal matter. We already kind of discussed that, the BSAOs, the wildlife presence in the field, we'd have to look at that. But given what we know, standard, um, we said that, it, you know, without any additional information, we recognize that that would be something we'd consider. Um, the moisture, so that, because that, the science does say that that would matter. Um, moisture, and so obviously we'd be looking at whether the harvest occurs during a rain event, wet, muddy, muddy conditions. When was the last irrigation or rain event? Was there flooding in previously? Because moisture does is a factor in whether the 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 risk of a, putting the cabbage on the on the ground. And then contact time. This is one that the group thought, given what they've seen in terms of um, uh, cabbage harvest, that well, it, we know it's a likely factor. Um, in this case, it's such a minimal time frame; it may not be. Um, it add increased, uh, you know, considerable risk to the, the this actual practice. And um, the other piece was how the cabbage is actually, so the actual practice of how the cabbage is placed on the soil. So given all that, um, I, we didn't come down and say risky, not risky. We weren't, we weren't that brave, but what we were able to do is we were able to say, what would we do? And we had it coming from different perspectives. So we have some folks weighing in and saying that there, we, they would have a high level conversation. And now I'm just speaking to the, the laying it on the ground, the harvest cabbage on the harvest, uh, laying the cabbage on the ground, not some of the other practices in there, in, in the scenario. Um, high level conversation about cons uh, considering the different risk fa factors noted. So all the ones we just talked about, making sure that the grower was aware of all those different risk factors, but nothing unless you saw something out of the ordinary in relation to them, um, nothing that would, um, raise uh, additional concerns. And then um, from the grow perspective, make sure that you had a SOP in place about harvesting, 
which would include addressing knife management, placement of cabbage on the ground, how that would occur, and then animal intrusion and other uh, factors associated with the fecal matter. So I think, I guess, so maybe we could, I'll just throw in maybe we could say not risky given now that I've just walked through that. So uh, group members, if you have a not risky, risky you wanna add, please do go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and then finally, because we were told we could ask questions, um, the, we had one question from a group member saying, um, I'm looking now, uh, Roger saying not risky. Uh, Roger, I'm actually trying to um, get your question, which is, should the, are there any commodity specific, specific risks or, how, or history of outbreaks related to the commodity? and whether that should be factored into the risk assessment, I think is where what the question is. Um, Roger, if I'm not articulating it well, please do go ahead and help me out there. But I think yeah, that's- Thanks, but that, that's it. I mean, I think that's something, you know, that uh, I as a grower want to know, what is the incidence of outbreaks related to anything I grow and to learn more about the factors involved in those outbreaks so that I can then mitigate them on the farm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say, and, and others on who are on the call, like Betsy, can can jump in with more background. But I, I, cabbage has not historically been linked to too many outbreaks. I, there was a very, very famous, the very first listeria outbreak uh, was uh, cattle cow, cabbage that was fertilized with uh, with sheep manure that did lead to um, some listeriosis cases, but generally not not risky. Sorry. Generally, I would say cabbage is less risky than other leafy greens. Um, I do, I do, I do like the idea that you guys, Wendy, that you guys sort of evaluated all the different aspects of the scenario. And the reason, the reason why the boxes were stored upright and they occasionally contained rainwater was we wanted to vary the quality of the waters that the products you were dealing with were exposed to. And so we couldn't uh, use a drainage ditch for everything. And so that was yeah. my way of suggesting, okay, here's some relatively pristine water that you now have contaminating. But obviously, yes, a best practice would be perhaps to store those boxes off the ground and not upright so they get, or indoors so they don't get rained in. Um, so, but, but I mean, yeah, and again, it, 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 it's fine that you didn't come up with a, a, a risky, not risky answer. I think the main thing is we wanted you to think through all of the different, different risk aspects of the scenario. I think you guys did that really well. Great. Another group, anything oh, to add? Yeah, our group, we, we spent some time talking about was this dropped produce? And um, so we decided, no, it was not dropped produce because this was part of their harvesting practices. Um, and all the cabbage fields I've ever been in, It'd be, you'd have to work really hard to put these heads on soil. They'd have to be in probably in soil in a dry row because the crop is planted so densely. Um, and so we talked about, you know, the cut end, the butt end of the, the cabbage and was that coming in contact with soil as being a higher risk. And um, also about the rainwater, right? That's the same water that's coming in direct contact with the cabbage that's still attached to the plant. So, um, we didn't consider that risky. But then we also talked about like the realities of if you're standing in the field talking to the grower about this practice, if he is indeed putting it on. Water on the ground, before bed burns 46 pounds into what does what does that mean for them, right? And it could mean a lot of monetary investments if you go into the route of that they need to um, invest in additional equipment that they might not have in order to harvest and place it onto maybe um, like a tractor wagon or, or, you know, if they don't have a packing house and that's why they're packing in the field. And so just trying to think of reasonable ways to deal with this lettuce and keeping it off or the, the cabbage and keeping it off the ground. And if they do have a crew that's coming through with boxes after, they could just simply put the, the cabbage heads on plants that had already been harvested from. So that way it's not coming in contact with the soil. I think that was in addition to, we had lots of conversations that topics were already covered. So I think I'll leave our groups at that. Thanks, Meredith. How about the third group with this question? That, uh, yeah, that was uh, our group number four. And this is Hans. And we actually assumed uh, this uh, was potentially a, a dropped pro produce situation and that there were red flags. Uh, that's sort of our risky um, overall assessment given uh, the scenario as written. 
So I'm not going to go into every all the excellent report outs on all of the variables and how things could change, uh, because, um, uh, you know, I guess it is an interesting question and maybe that we should discuss this as a larger group of whether or not this would actually be considered drop uh, produce and under what situation. In other words, cabbage does grow on the ground, but it doesn't come in contact with the ground, generally speaking, especially the part that ends up getting trimmed, um, basically never does. Um, so yeah, the how, um, thankfully also we had Anna who's worked on, um, worked on harvest, um, cabbage harvesting crews in, and, uh, on her fa um, farm that she's no longer part of, but, um, so, you know, just experience there. And I've also worked on farms and harvested a lot of cabbage. Um, so yeah, the feeling that, um, the cutter, um, depending on how they cut and they're, you know, the, they're not that, that, that trim, the cabbage not touching the ground, um, potentially, uh, and there's no or very low risk of that. Um, that said, um, there's also a hand washing a variable that no one has mentioned yet where you've got a crew and that cutter is not going to be able to cut all day. So there has to be switch ups and tool switches and things like that. So having some equipment um, for, for actually cleaning uh, or hand washing um, out in the, <clears throat> uh, in the field is, would be a good idea. Um, and I uh, also noting that the <clears throat> doesn't say the boxes are stored on the ground, but they are stored outside. So that, that would be a variable and where outside they're stored would be a variable. So the rain is true. It's the same rainwater, but the, the, you know, are the boxes, uh, have they been cleaned and sanitized before they went out and where, where were they when, um, so if basically they had some contamination in them and then the rain acted as a vector uh, for that contamination, that would be a big red flag, um, whereas um, that might not be a red flag in the cabbage field. Um, okay, if anyone wants to add anyone, oh yeah, process, we did about the same thing. So we didn't, we actually started with the thing I've done as a science teacher often, which is, you know, if you look at a statement like this, uh, the answer is is never uh, straightforward. It should start with, uh, well, it depends. And then you put a comma and you take a breath and then analyze all. So that's how we started. We did that and um, all wrote our own sort of high risk version of this and lower risk version of this and um, basically pointed out the things that were already said uh, with the addition of that hand washing. Uh, anyone from our group want to add to that? I think you summed it up pretty well. I mean, in general, I think it was variable based once we got to the laid on the ground. And then that became the, well, was it laid on the ground or is laid on the ground as in laid on the ground in the leaves? And then from there, we kind of branched off into different low risk, high risk categories. But other than that. Yep. Thanks, Anna. Great. So um, let me no, go ahead. I, oh. Ben, I just want to say, so we, the session is supposed to end at 1230, but I think the conversation oh, yeah. is really good and I'm going to let it go. Like, I'm just going to go as long as we need to kind of go through these questions. I recognize that people might want to drop off for lunch and that's fine, but just to give a heads up, I'm not going to strive to, to get us done in eight minutes. I'm going to let the conversation go because I think it's valuable. So go ahead, Ben. Great. Yeah. I just want to highlight something that um, Han said that I think is really key, and Don and I find this a lot. Um, you know, often we're we're faced with questions that come in that we're trying to figure out what the person who's asking the question means, like like what's the framing right of this. And and so Hans, you, you started this off. Your group started this off, really saying you know the way that this question is written, and that's kind of the like the important part of this, this exercise is so much about what we're presented with either on our podcast or as extension specialists, we've got to ask more questions to understand more. Okay. What do you mean here by laid on the ground? What is that? What, what does that mean? And can you show me a picture? Can you demonstrate that to me so I can get a better sense of what you're doing and what you're seeing? And I've, I've done a bunch of research in this area, not so much with production agriculture, but with consumers. And when we ask them what they do, they can 
sort of say, here's what it is that I do. But then when we watch them, it is so different from what they said they were doing. They're not thinking about the things that we are as microbiologists. And so, so I think it's really, really important for us to like that. That's the, the big takeaway for me is you've got three different groups that viewed this and sometimes two of them a very similar way and one of like a different way because of the wording on how it was asked. And that's what we're doing on a, on a daily basis with these questions. I agree with, with so much of what was, what was shared. I think um, Meredith's group, I, I too started at, Tell me more about how the what's happening with the cut end. Where is that going? Is that being laid on an area where it could lead to contamination? I don't want to add any more to this, but I think this that was a very like it, it's a it's a point we shouldn't we shouldn't miss miss in the discussion. Anything, Don, before we go to the next scenario? No, go ahead. Okay. So the next scenario is dwarf or semi-dwarf apple trees that are overloaded with apples, tips over under the weight with one side of apples touching the ground. So we have two groups, who would like to go first? We can go first, my group can go. So we spent the first few minutes talking about how we would pull the string on this question to try and see what the different variables that could um, lead us to an assertion of risky or not risky sort of down the line on this. So questions we would ask are, okay, are these dwarf apples trellised or are they supposed to be supported? Um, if they are trellised, have they, how long have they been leaning over for and drooping to the ground? Uh, what type of orchard is this? Is this uh, a PYO or is this for a wholesale distributor? We talked about what sort of ground the apples are contacting. Is it grass? Is it bare soil? What maintenance activities have been done to this ground in the last year, either cleaning up from last year's harvest or preparing for this year's harvest in terms of mulching or just letting detritus sort of settle on the ground, right? So what does the ground look like? Um, are, the mark, are the apples for fresh market? We assumed that yes, these apples would be for fresh market. Are the apples close to harvest? We assumed yes. In this scenario, the apples would be reasonably close to harvest. Um, we did have a conversation about weather, uh, different rain events, you know, could definitely sway our assertion of more or less risky on this one. Um, and then we had a long conversation about uh, animal and wildlife presence. So I had the ability to have folks in the group were from different regions. So I asked them, well, would it be reasonably likely to assume you know, we talked about the different wildlife pressures and the different animal pressures. Um, we talked about dogs a lot. And then we also talked about deer. And so we kind of came up with this reasonable um, assumption that it would be reasonably likely to encounter deer droppings on the ground somewhere in a quarter acre sort of um, scenario here, because we didn't say, see anything in the scenario that would um, show that the, the farm is fenced in, right? So we have reasonably likely to assume that there might be deer droppings on the ground somewhere, right? Where these apples are tipping over. And then we also had a discussion about water, how, if apples are contacting water. And so because these are dwarf apples, we, you know, talking through the different things that each person has seen in their region with dwarf apples, most of the dwarf apples are, um, irrigated with um, drip irrigation or subsurface irrigation, right? So then it becomes um, a question of what sort of quality of the water is being used in this irrigation, but because we're using subsurface irrigation, right, uh, there might be a, a larger chance that water could contact these drooping apples in a significant way, right? And then we factored into, we didn't know anything about the ground, right? But if the ground was sufficiently, had a lot of, had a lot of refuse or wasn't mulched or whatever, then, then water is going to be contacting these apples. So then I had the folks in the group make a decision if this was uh, risky or not, what to do with these apples, right? And so we were actually a little bit split. We did have a significant, we had three folks say that this was risky and someone specifically mentioned that, you know, the whole point of this, you know, looking at individual risk versus risk of the company, right? If this was on your individual farm, she would probably take these apples and eat them. But because they were, we assumed that they would be going to, you know, wholesale distribution, it was too risky. 
Um, and then we did have a contingent of folks in our group that said it was lower risk, um, specifically lower risk because they would be uh, harvesting these apples and using sanitizer on the wash water later on. And then another person said, you know, it could be low risk depending on the situation, what the ground looked like. So we were pretty split. Thanks, Angela. All right, what about the other group? Hi, uh, we, we went into a similar discussion and in our group, and we mainly have to conclude that we have to deal with bruising and damage to the produce, which introduce a higher risk in a dropper produce. So in this case, uh, apples. So understanding that dropper produce is the highest or the biggest issues in this uh, scenario, we also discuss how we can communicate this kind of issue with growers. So communication is important, having to translate in science into a something that is very practical and understandably and applicable into, into the farm. So the vast, we conclude that the vast majority of the apple go to fresh eating and go to, into a packing house. And then storage is also important. And I'm not gonna talk about all of those issues that. Uh, the other group say because we we were discussing discussing all of those as well, and we conclude that the, the pathogens may may transfer a higher rate base if the condition were into this produce where where, uh, 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 where drops if it is secure you know hard surface soil grass humidity uh, wetness of the soil UV index and things like that. And, all, and this apple industry have a lot of data on that. There is a, a vast information and we can find, you know, data from science to support growers into this uh, risk assessment. And we conclude that uh, if um, the apple rolls onto the grass, there is less contamination, more micro fecal matter, moisture, organic matter, or soil that on the grass, Left damage probably due to cushion or grass, seeing it is rolled. It was immediately recovered. We, we need to think about that with growers as well. If it is, was recovered and then inspected for damage, if it is no visible damage on those apples, then add it back to the fresh bean. So what we say was it is have relation with brush damage and all those um, steps that uh, grower can go into the handling process even storage, if the storage is in favor for bacterial growth or things like that. Also, we talk about if those apples were recovered and then put it back into the bin, is, is that going to be a kill step? Is, is this kill step going to be safe? It's going to be into the huge industry or something like that? And we also talk about that sometimes it's really challenging for farm managers, even for owners, making sure that the crew harvest is gonna follow some step to make sure that everything is gonna be safe. So it is important to having those science, some data, and then translate it into a way that the people that is doing the job understand and apply all of those knowledge into the practice in the farm management and also the harvesting part. I don't know if somebody else into the group wants to add anything else. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. And actually, I was realizing you were, uh, we have another apple example. And I think that's the one that you were talking about where they harvest and it rolls onto the ground. Um, and maybe that would be a good one to do right after this, since you just went through your analysis of that. Um, I appreciate that. So did, was there another group who had the semi-dwarf apple drooping question? No? Okay. Uh, ben and Don, anything to add to this? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually glad that Ricardo spoke up and talked about what his group did, because I think uh, one of the, the first group did not touch. And I guess, again, it's all in how you interpret the scenario, right? Uh, the, 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 the tree tips over, like, does it tip over slowly or did it tip over all at once? And if it tipped over all at once, there might be some damage to the apples. And, and again, so it was good that Ricardo talked about that. But no, I think, I think both groups did a really nice job of laying out, you know, all of the issues. Uh, what's, what is, what's the ground look like? Uh, 
have there been rain events? What's what's going on with animal intrusion? Um, you know, uh, all of that, um, and that comes into play. I mean, speaking for myself, if this was uh, some Martha Stewart apples falling in that pristine green grass, I wouldn't, I would have to say not risky. It looks, looks pretty clean to me, but uh, yeah, I mean, the groups, I think the groups all did a really nice job. Yeah, the, the only thing I'll add, I'm just gonna um, come back to something that I think it was Roger who said in the last group, um, as a producer looking at the historic um, outbreaks and risks associated with, the commodity or or this kind of um, you know cropping um, process, I you know we we in, in Angela's group really tackled this well with looking at animal intrusion. I think the the operative thing that I would want to know is okay. Let me scout out what's happening in my orchard. Do I see any deer dropping at all? Like because immediately now I'm thinking this is. That, like now I'm going towards risky, but if I don't have history of that, or if I have something that is keeping those animals out, even though it's certainly not a hundred percent, I have more, I have more context of the history of the, uh, of the site. Uh, I'm, I'm less likely as Don said to, to move towards risky. Um, and I, I also, and I, I think that um, Ricardo mentioned this, thinking about the damage that's happening potentially to those um to those apples that's important here as well so it's this is a what of a complicated and depends and i think i need a little more information with the information presented in the picture that i see at the guide i'm more towards um not risky okay great let me actually go to the apple the other apple example um, so while transferring apples from a picking bag to the bin, some roll off onto the ground. So are there, who's we, got that? Go ahead, Steph. No, we can go. Um, we discussed this and again, everyone chime in in our group. We felt it was um, a risk and the apples had to be removed from commerce. We thought that there was a, a variety of factors, certainly the, the food safety factors um, that the, they could be bruised, and so that would be a vehicle for contamination. We also didn't really know anything about the ground. Uh, this is a post-harvest activity. We, um, was this inside? Were people walking around in the pack wash shed? Was it outside? Was it in areas where um, people were walking? Was there livestock, animal intrusion? Was it a pick your own operation with babies and, and whatnot around? So, um, and then we also thought from of a labor perspective, well, could we could we take those apples and and move them into a different a market channel like cider or something? And so then we're like, um, ah, that's going to be inefficient. And then um, even if it was pasteurized cider, that wouldn't be an effective kill step. Um, we weren't sure what the science said on that. We know that there are some states that have um, uh, restrictions that even that wouldn't uh, be. But we'd love to know the science and pasteurization, and and would that take care of it? So could we at least use the apples for some of that effect? Um, on some farms, people have gone on in our group. Um, the farmer wants to sell them to customers who say that they'll make applesauce, but no go on that either because uh, we can't ensure that the people actually will you know make applesauce or whatnot out of that. So um, that was a no go as well. And so. No matter how you slice it, it it became it became a a, a risk. Wouldn't do it. Um, we discussed time on the ground. That didn't seem to matter. It hit the ground. We had fun conversations on um, patulin, which uh, Abby and Heather helped us as identify and levels there. And so um, and then also just from a, a produce quality perspective, if it's a bruised apple, would you want to sell that to your customers as well? Um, People did feel that this was an effective tool at the table. And in our notes, we had recommendations for augmenting that tool to make it even um, more usable and effective. Um, so, and then the rule was also kind of black and white on this. And so we, we didn't really have to, um, so we, we had to force ourselves to, to not go from the regulatory perspective. And I don't know if anyone else has anything to add in, um, in our group. Thanks, Seth. And Ricardo, I apologize. I may have just confused the scenarios in my head. So if there, if you did not have this one, who the other group, go ahead and report. I did confuse it. Go ahead, Claire. So Ricardo, I apologize for my confusion I was, earlier. I was actually with, in the group with Ricardo and yeah, we were talking about this scenario. Okay. But 
yeah, some points overlap, so I think it worked yep. out. No, that's great. Okay, Don or Ben, anything? Yeah, I, I really like the I, the suggestion of alternative distribution channels, uh, you know, and sending them to CIDR. I mean, I think that's a reasonable uh, risk risk mitigation. I mean, we have the same thing with uh, beef. If you have a eat beef that are uh, beef trimmings that are positive for E. coli, you you send them to somebody that you know is going to cook them. So um, whether that's allowed or not under the regulations, from a risk perspective, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And no, I, I think this this group also did a really really nice job. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the the discussion of tell us more about the ground really matters here and how long that uh, not how long, but what the what wh whether it was wet, whether there's a lot of moisture on the ground, that's going to increase the likelihood of uh, of contamination um, potential. Um, so this this one, yeah, I think they I think they did a really good really good job. Great. Oh, I went the wrong way. All right, let's go back. Tomatoes. Tomatoes in a greenhouse that are trellised, but the trellis fails. All right, who'd like to go first? I can speak up on that if that's okay. Yep. Yeah, so um, I'm thankful to my group. We had a lively discussion. And to start out, we automatically were like, well, what about this and what about that? So some things we were thinking of were, well, how much injury and damage mm -hmm. is there to the fruit? Um, are the vines themselves touching the ground? Did they snap? What type of trellis is it actually structurally, you know, strong, or is it just a weak one? What's their pest management? You know, are there birds present? So there, we just went through a whole list of variables that could be there. So when we did that, we ended up well. There has to be different categories of risk we're looking at, whether it's high risk, low risk, or medium risk, because just saying all of you know all of them to to go to the trash bin could be unreasonable in certain situations so we decided well what tomatoes should the grower keep if any should they be sold to fresh market or be given to a commercial processing you know location or to a local restaurant so they can do a full step for anything so in the area of high risk and after reading these if any of my teammates have anything to add please speak up but for high risk, we kind of looked at, well, are the tomatoes in direct contact with the ground? Are there visible cuts and injury to each of these um, tomatoes? As we know, that bruising can easily happen, which then cross-contamination could be there. For uh, a low risk, we end up looking at, well, if the tomatoes are broken on the um, tomatoes on the broken trellis, they're not really in direct contact with the ground, but they're kind of above you know, and they don't really appear to be splashed on by any dirt or anything else, and then that would be of a lower risk. And then even if it's intended for commercial processing, that's extremely low risk in our eyes. But then we also looked at, well, what would be a medium risk? What would fall into that? And we noted, well, you know, there may be some tomatoes that were in direct contact with the ground, but then there may not be, you know, there may be some that are not. So then we have to say, well, grower, you could keep some some other tomato could go to a different location to be processed, and then others um, inevitably would have to then be removed from um, the process. So that's kind of where we were, and teammates, please feel free to speak up if I missed anything. Thanks, Michael. Uh, other group? I can go. Um, so, Greenhouse tomato, uh, not a lot of information to go on. Um, so we had to decide what kind of tomato. So a cherry tomato versus an heirloom tomato, different kind of risk if it's falling and hitting the ground. Um, did it actually hit the ground? Um, how long was it there? Was the ground wet? Um, what was the developmental stage of the tomato? And then we got into a discussion about if there are tomatoes still in the vine, if you can restring those and keep picking them. Um, but ultimately our discussion was that if the tomatoes hit the ground, there's bruising damage there and that's where the risk would be. But if um, we assume that our, our uh, trellis tomatoes were string and clip. Um, so based on that, you know, basically those tomatoes would have to end up hitting the ground for that to be a risky situation. Otherwise, you could potentially just string them back up if there wasn't any damage to the fruit. Um, 
but those, I, without going on and on, I think those were our big factors that we discussed. Um, we also talked about how you could reroute them, but if you're losing one string, um, I'm pretty sure you're not going to worry about the the options for your three tomatoes that hit the ground. So I think we were just, we focused mainly on discarding the fruit as they had hit the ground and been bruised. Thanks, Kristen. Okay, how about the third group? Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, <clears throat> so it sounds like our, our discussion was similar to the other groups that had this scenario. And in keeping with uh, those, those discussions and sounds like all these scenarios, we ultimately determined that it was complicated. And it might depend on a lot of factors. Um, and, and ultimately what we did would depend on uh, the nature of our visit and, and what our role is on the farm. But um, we, we talked about, you know, in, in the greenhouse, we can maybe assume that there's a certain level of, of control of that environment, but there are a lot of environmental factors still to consider. Um, some of those that have been discussed by the other groups, but um, is there a presence of animals or pests or are there other animals uh, in other areas on the farm? Is there a possibility that, that, um, you know, in particular, if, if the, these tomatoes are in contact with the ground after the trellis fails, um, that people have walked from those areas where there are animals into the greenhouse. Um, what's the nature of, of the ground in the greenhouse? Is it bare ground or is there landscape fabric or, or some kind of plastic? And, and how clean is that? Um, and is it wet? And so all these are, are sort of the environmental factors that may that we just we, we talked about may, um, you know, come into play when determining the, the risk factors and the um, possibility of contamination. Um, but also, you know, what kind of trellis is, is it as was mentioned before and what's the extent of the damage? What, what kind of disaster are we dealing with? Um, and, and to that end, what's the, the extent of the damage to the fruit itself and where there's damage to the fruit? Obviously, we, we talked about that there'd be a much higher risk um, for contamination. And so um, determining whether or not those tomatoes uh, could be harvested and the risk could be harvested and what the risk level was um, we talked about, you know, if, if the tomatoes had come into contact with the ground, uh, as, as Michael mentioned, that those were higher risk, um, but maybe there was a possibility of, of saving or salvaging tomatoes that um, had not been affected. Uh, and also, um, let me, sorry, I want to check my notes here. <clears throat> um, you know, other factors like, like as was already mentioned, the kinds of tomatoes, um, even the age of, of the tomatoes, it might be a possibility to fix and rehang the trellis and then visually inspect those again um, and, and inspect them as well at harvest. Um, and then, you know, also to consider other markets, we're assuming that these were for fresh market, but um, if there was, um, you know, in our determination, the potential for um, a risk that we might consider other markets for those tomatoes, such as further processing. So I hope that I did our, our group discussion, which was incredible um, justice in that summary. And I hope that uh, anyone would chime in if, if I missed something. So, Thanks, Kirby. Elizabeth, let me let me add, just ask a, a couple of questions. I think this is a really good example where um, each of the three groups really approach this in a, it's not black or white just because the trellis falls. What we really need to know is where did those tomatoes go and what did they hit? What did they bruise, right? Like, so it's not just a guidance of trellis failing equals bad or, or risky. And I think you, you all approach that in a very, practical way. One thing that both Kristen's group and Kirby's group brought up that I want to ask and I understand more of is you you both mentioned what type of tomato matters, like cherry versus heirloom. So can you help me understand why that might impact the risk? And what your what your thoughts were on that? We were thinking about force and how so the trellising system from a how far did it fall? And the size of the tomato with force, you know, you, you've got thick skin tomatoes that, you know, you've got tomatoes that are more likely to bruise than others. So gotcha. thinking about that. if it was a droop, you know what I mean? If it, yeah. if it was six inches, um, not so worried. If it's an heirloom tomato and it dropped from six feet, it's going to split. More likely to have bruising and splitting. Perfect. That's, that, that's what I was missing context wise, but that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense that just the, the size and, and likelihood to, to open up and then introduce the potential for pathogen. So it's great, thank you. Okay, just, just any, one, 
Yep. One quick, sorry, one quick comment, and I apologize. I was I was away and I wasn't listening to the whole discussion. One of the reasons I think for setting up a greenhouse scenario is the thought that maybe greenhouses have are lower risk than outdoor production. Did any of the groups talk about talk about that? And apologies if you said it in your remarks and I missed it. Or do people not believe that? I can speak on that if if it's okay. Sure. Yeah, our group did mention like, well, you know, being outside in the elements is a whole nother risk factor versus having a greenhouse. But then when we've been looking at a greenhouse, is the greenhouse structurally stable? We understand that it's protected from rain most likely. We've got ventilation, we've got lighting for growing, helping out with that. But then if it's a type of greenhouse that's pretty much falling over all the time, <laughs> then what real protection is it giving? So Based off those scenarios, there's different environmental impacts. There's different challenges if um, domestic animals are going through or even wildlife. And how open is that greenhouse to the exterior as well? That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you, Michael. Okay, let's go to the last one, onions. So onions are harvested with a mechanical harvester that lifts the crop and lays the onions on the ground to be picked up later. Go ahead, first group. I can go. Um, so this one was a bit different in that it was a, a scenario that's a regular common practice with onions in many places. Um, so we started out talking about just sort of what risk are we willing to live with, you know, like um, very high level. But once we started drilling into the, the factors that would influence whether or not this is risky, um, one of the questions was where might pathogens come from? So we talked about sur surrounding land use, which may be largely out of the control of the farmer. And are you gonna tell them not to grow onions? No, so there might be limited mitigation there. Um, flooding events, wildlife, where wildlife paths can be managed somewhat. Um, you don't have a lot of wildlife going after onions, but they might be going after the corn in the field next door. Um, so do you have to install fencing or that kind of thing? Um, and then a big thing for this scenario specifically is the equipment storage. That mechanical harvester, where are you parking it? Are birds landing on it? Um, are you maintaining it, cleaning and sanitizing it properly? And what's the skill of the person using the equipment? Um, because that leads into whether the produce is being injured during the harvest. And that, that's the huge control point here. Um, we did talk about how concerns about dropped produce started out as concern about the injury that occurs when that produce is dropped. And that's, there's sort of a parallel here with injury that might occur during the harvest. Um, then we discussed environmental conditions during the storage period on the ground there. We had folks from the Northwest and the Northeast where conditions are very different. You have arid conditions in the Northwest where they grow onions, but up here you might have to move the onions to a storage facility for the curing process if your ground is wet. Um, so the fate of that produce, once it either has been injured or not, um, your curing location, is it outside on the ground right where you harvested it or are you moving it indoors? Um, and the primary goal during that period should be to facilitate the curing process because that will sort of seal the onion. That skin is very protective. Um, and then we discussed whether the market for that onion should affect your determination, um, if it's going to a fresh market or for processing. Um, we talked about how risky are the pathogens of concern. Um, here we sort of assumed that we'd be worried about salmonella given recent uh, history. And um, the fact came up that salmonella is, causes millions of illnesses annually with a very small infective dose. So you might have some uh, serious concern about it and that it has reservoirs everywhere in the environment. Um, but that circles back to what risk are we willing to live with? And this is a very common practice. So as long as the inspector is sort of happy with their discussion with the farmer, um, we overall thought that this wasn't very risky. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Wes? Yeah, uh, I'll go to the bottom line. We didn't think this was very risky. Uh, it's, it, your, your t it, oh, by the way, and what Ben said so early on, makes a lot of sense. You see, you get the scenario, but you, you didn't see the picture. And 
we were looking at it with different types of onions, whether it's a short storage onion, such as a, a, a Vidalia type or, a, or a, a long storage onion, and they're handled completely different. But it is, it's really the, the equipment, how it's maintained, and is there a possibility where there was something could be introduced from that equipment because it wasn't maintained properly. Uh, and also when they're harvested, uh, harvesting when drier periods versus if it's going to rain, for instance. So delay harvesting uh, to reduce the risk from, from uh, rain and movement from, uh, say, from outside the field into the field. Uh, overall, uh, as far as risk that we looked, talked about was the field history and what, again, what is the surrounding some animal intrusion, but again, what's been said before, onions aren't a very big uh, crop for uh, a lot of, uh, of animals coming in. The, again, type of onion, how it's cured. Uh, if you're talking about a, a storage onion, you know, it may be picked up by a piece of equipment and moved into the, to the next row to cure till the end of the day, then they come back and pick all, all of them up, either by hand or by equipment. And if they're going into bins, for instance, for storage, again, where the, the situation with that bin, where was it stored? How was it cleaned beforehand? Uh, if you're leaving bins out in the field, and we're talking about half ton, ton of bins, uh, are they covered to protect them from say rainfall if they're out there for, for several days, which with some dry bulb onions, that, that is, that's the way they're, they're stored. Um, I already talked about the equipment, what type type of onions, um, soil type, heavier soil types have a tendency to hold soil longer on onions, on again, dry bulb onions. But again, that's the same soil that they're, they were harvested out of grown in. So that shouldn't be a major factor. Um, that's basically it. Terrific, thank you. Ben or Don? Yeah. Um, what I dropped the link into the um, into the chat about the October 2021 um, onion outbreak, and I think that this is one where it actually goes back to something that I um, I think was was mentioned earlier by Roger, just about history. I think you know the more we learn from these outbreak investigations, if we see that it's a similar type of production process or harvesting process that's common, that that maybe we envision things we, we change our mind on on risks as, as we learn more about outbreaks that that if it's something where these are laying on the ground and, and it is a water facilitated movement of um, potentially salmonella into into those onions then now all of a sudden I think it's a different answer to the question I think if we look back on history of 40 years of produce related um, outbreaks and not seeing a lot of this type of um, production um, uh, uh, approach leading to those illnesses. Uh, I, I think that, that that plays into our, it, to me, it plays into my answer. But all of a sudden, if we if we find just one investigation that thinks that this is um, a, a, a risk now, now all of a sudden I'm looking at it in a, in a different light. And that's where we have to, I think, constantly be flexible about what we learn from these outbreak investigations. But I really like the approach of, of both of the, um, but, you know, the very thorough approach of both of these groups. Don, anything to add? No, nothing for me. I think this, this is good, uh, good discussions. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much. I, I appreciate everybody giving extra 27 minutes to this, to this discussion, but I think it, it's been valuable and it's certainly been very, very um, interesting to, to listen to. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to thank thank Ben and Don again for their time and their uh, energy and their expertise that they contributed to this session. It's very much appreciated. Um, that wraps us up for this this morning. Uh, it's now lunch, and we will reconvene um, back at 1.30 for our afternoon report out and articulation of next steps for the next year. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time, and we'll see everybody again at 1.30. Take care. I'm sorry. Yes, 1.30. Take care. Thanks. <laughs>